A 343 dev reveals some interesting information about Last Spartan Standing. Halo Infinite World Finals event finally announced and tickets on sale soon. The most popular gaming franchise on the earth changes their name. And a Call of Duty Pro player says that the new Modern Warfare 2 game that's coming out this year, not good. And a whole lot more. So stay tuned throughout the whole video to understand all the details. So if you're like me, you've probably been playing a lot of Last Spartan Standing for Season 2, and if you have the extra lives, you tend to actually spawn in pretty bad locations towards the end of the game. You can see an example right here, where I spawned outside the circle and started taking a lot of damage and started really kind of freaking out, like, oh god, I need to get in as soon as possible. Well, a 343 dev recently went onto Twitter to get, provide some information about Last Spartan Standing. I think it's crucial for everyone to know for the game mechanic of how to actually survive these pretty bad situations, to be honest. 343 dev here says, Says that there's a last spawn sitting PSA. If you spawn out in the danger zone, you take 75% less damage from the zone until you either deal damage to another player or enter the safe area. Now looking at this clip I just showed you of me playing the game where I basically spawned outside the circle, I, technically I spawned inside the circle here. So you can see that when I go out into the circle here to kind of get back into the level field of play, well, then I start taking that normal damage. But if I spawn outside the circle, then it's really not that stressful, which is a good thing to know about when it comes to playing Last Spartan Standing, because uh, that's kind of one of the awkward things about this mode that if you're down to like the final like two players like I am in this situation and you both have extra lives you will spawn out in the circle so it's very important to know that so when you make your way into the field of play that you don't overextend yourself or don't start shooting right away because you're panicking because you're taking damage be patient know that fat information and kind of play to it towards your advantage kind of thing right here but you can see right here now I spawn outside the circle once I spawn back into this match, and you'll see that my health bar is actually drastically reducing a lot less, like far less bits are going down. But I just kind of had a bad spawn in this situation, so I didn't really get the kill there, sadly. But it's good information to know about Last Spartan Standing. The 343 developer here does go into why this situation happens to give us a little more context of why people spawn in the danger zone when it comes to playing this mode, saying, naturally, I don't want to spawn you in the danger zone, but forcing spawns into a shrinking playable space can give you a fish in a barrel experience, especially late game when it matters most. Tried that, bigger frowns. What's there pulls you nearer the edge, plus reduces punishment instead. So I think this is a good compromise for the mechanic that they have, because usually when it comes to normal like battle royale kind of game modes, right? Either you lose all your respawn mechanics or the ability to respawn is removed. Like we have in Apex Legends, right? You have those little locations where you go to station to respawn people, usually towards the end of the game, like with the last few circles, there is no respawn ability. And also with like Warzone, right? For Call of Duty, that the Gulag closes down, I believe after like about 20 or 30 players or less or something like that in the match. So this is why we kind of experienced this in Halo and not in other kind of BR type game modes. Of course, we'll have to wait and see if we experience this with the supposed Tatanka mode, which is going to possibly be a battle royale, which I highly suspect it to be announced or like some kind of big game mode that Sword Infinity is working on, Project Tatanka, going to be announced next month in June, guys. That's when all the big game announcements happen. Now, definitely we'll cover that in depth on the channel once we get some good information about it. Now, I'm sure many of you remember this roadmap right here. This is the HCS roadmap for the entire year. We finally got some information about the HCS World Finals happening in Seattle on October 20th through the 23rd. Head of HCS Tashi hit up Twitter saying that Orlando Major is going to be from September 23rd to September 25th. It's going to be at the Orange County Convention Center. And the Halo World Championships is going to be October 20th through the 23rd at the Washington State Convention Center. Now I'm from Seattle. This is where they hold packs. They're expecting this event to be big it's going to be a really awesome event previously they had it like a local event that was kind of a little bit a little bit smaller but still with pretty good size they did that for the like 2018 finals and they also said that tickets for both will go on sale in june that's next month so if you want to make it to the hcs world finals which i guys if you haven't done that before trust me going to an event is a ton of fun if you're a halo fan you definitely want to check it out it's so much more than just watching competitive Halo and also gives you a chance to kind of meet up with the community as well. I will 100% be at this world final since I'm only like 40 minutes away from the venue so I'll definitely be there. And of course once these tickets do go on sale make sure to make a video about it guys so you all know about it to stay inside the loop or I'll make a channel post on the channel here so just make sure you subscribe to keep yourself up to date with everything going on with Halo.
In other gaming news, Call of Duty Pro player Sensor right here actually has some insights about the new Call of Duty that coming out this year, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2022. And from his sources, he says the game is trash, but I'll take it low. Let's take his word for what he says exactly here. How we feel about MW2? So from my sources, the game's shit. That's my sources. I'm not leaking my sources, but I heard the game is shit. And it's from sources I trust, so... I'm cautiously optimistic, because you guys know I'm always optimistic about the new COD. I'm cautiously optimistic this year. Yeah, so that's happening. So that's kind of concerning where like a guy who's considerable member of the Call of Duty community and you know probably has some good inside sources being a prominent pro player um that's kind of concerning because i'm actually really looking forward to the new call of duty game this year of course these are leaks rumors and you know you know his sources or some probably some other pro players that might have some insights into the development of the game and stuff like that um i mean to a pro player a trash game can be very different compared to like a player who plays the game socially like myself i don't really care to play the game uh, competitively in any kind of manner um though i do want it to be fair and fun and Sensor, though, does have a history of being a little too hype or a little bit too hyperbolic, almost in a way, when it comes to Call of Duties. Some people have actually screenshotted some of his tweets saying that, like, each Call of Duty before the year it comes out, it's going to be the best Call of Duty of all time, like World War II, Black Ops 4, Modern Warfare, which actually was a pretty good COD, not going to lie. Uh, Cold War is going to be the best Call of Duty ever and things like that. And it's like Vanguard's going to be amazing. Uh, but hearing him being cautiously optimistic is certainly a bit concerning. Uh, we did cover this previously that it looks like we will begin a reveal of Call of Duty most likely next month, probably more campaign related, as you typically do with the news cycle when it comes to Call of Duty. And of course, once we get some good information, I'll share with you guys here on the channel. Now, the most popular gaming franchise on the earth of all time, most money revenue, biggest name of all time, FIFA Sports from EA is changing the name to EA Sports FC, mainly because FIFA, which is like the biggest organization that helps, you know, run the soccer leagues out in like international leagues and stuff like that. Uh, they wanted a lot of money to say FIFA on the box. I mean, reportedly, FIFA wanted $1 billion every year for four years to put FIFA on the box. Now, to the equivalent of saying like for you US fans, playing like an NBA game and it doesn't say NBA on it. Of course, EA does get away with this with football, calling their football games Madden. EA themselves, so take it at their word because EA is not that trustful when it comes to their uh, PR stuff, but they do say that everything you love about the game will be part of EA Sports FC. The same great experience, modes, leagues, tournaments, clubs, and athletes will be there, which is very important because when it comes to these sports games, like you want to play as those players that you know as, and if their names are not licensed to that organization like FIFA, then you'd be fine. With other games like with the NFL and also with the NBA, they have their names tied to the brand of that league, so that's why it would be really important to make sure they maintain the integrity of that. But it looks like EA won't really have a problem with that, saying that like Ultimate Team, Career Mode, Pro Clubs, and Volta Football will be there as well. On top of the 19,000 players, 700 plus teams, 100 plus stadiums, 30 leagues, and things like that. So it sounds like it's gonna be essentially the same game, but you know, with a different name. And with a big change like this, the CEO of EA, Andrew Wilson, also chimed in on this saying that FIFA for the soccer game that they put out was really just four letters on the box. That's all he really said. And he basically said that uh, I would argue that this may be a little bit biased that the FIFA brand has more meaning as a video game than it does a governing body of soccer, which is a little bit of a jab right there to FIFA being like, yeah, you're trying to charge us a billion dollars a year just to have your name on the box. Screw that. I'm going to do my own thing. And that kind of would make sense when it comes to the EA side of things. In some YouTube gaming news, because you're on YouTube, you're probably in the gaming if you're watching this stuff right here, that channel memberships have now have the ability to be gifted for live streamers. Just kind of like how gifting subs is on Twitch. It sounds very similar to the YouTube membership gifting ability now, which is absolutely huge. It's a huge source of revenue for streamers to be able to have people who are willing to gift memberships or subs to the channel. This is an absolutely huge step forward. And the global head of gaming creators for YouTube went on Twitter also saying that you get a 70-30 revenue split for creators, which is really nice compared to Twitch, it's 50-50. That's 70-30 right now is for revenue for the partner channels on Twitch. But the recent rumors are that they might lower that down to 50-50 on Twitch. So 70-30 revenue split, I mean, 
people are going to go where the money is. And if you've built up your YouTube channel, if you're a streamer, that's going to be looking quite nice, honestly. Also, the ability to bulk purchase different memberships for like one, five, or 20 gifted viewers at one time kind of thing. So YouTube genuinely taking their streaming service very seriously. They're not just buying out the big name streamers out there like Tim the Tatman, Dr. Lupo. I believe Valkyrie is also on YouTube now as well. And it's great to see Twitch is getting some legitimate competition when it comes to the live streaming area because right now it's just, it used to be just Twitch pretty much. Like Mixer tried, they failed. And but YouTube seems to be doing all right for themselves. And it'd be quite interesting to see what other kind of features they decide to pull off. Obviously Twitch is much more feature rich when it comes to the experience as a streamer. YouTube also recently add in the ability to raid other streamers like you can on Twitch. But the thing is, it's very convoluted, very complicated. We're on ra on Twitch, it's just, you know, raid, go. Uh, on YouTube, it's much more complicated. You kind of have both approval from both channels and things like that. It's a hassle, but at least it's they're getting there though. In some non-gaming news, but some good stuff, because I'm sure you're all Star Wars fans, pretty much everybody is, right? That the Ahsoka show, which is probably the most anticipated bit of media I am looking forward to in the next probably like last three years or whatever since it was announced, the original series has started production. They started filming on May 9th. So it's still slated to hit the streaming service of Disney Plus early 2023. So we still have quite some time, basically a year until it actually releases. But I'm really looking forward to this. We also have the Open One show coming out this month, which is going to be awesome. As someone who ended up being like a huge Clone Wars fan because I wanted to see more Ahsoka and my wife as well after watching the Mandalorian episodes, we watched the entire series of Clone Wars because it's awesome. And it basically is like Ahsoka's story throughout the entirety of that show, which is really cool. So if you want to get some good backstory before jumping into the show, absolutely watch Clone Wars. Trust me, guys, it's worth it. I do believe I'll have some ties into the Star Wars Rebels cartoon as well. If you guys remember when you saw Ahsoka in The Mandalorian, she, you know, clashed swords with the guy and said, where is Ezra? Ezra was the main character in Rebels. And wherever Ezra is, that's where Thrawn is. And so it is going to be a very exciting show to check out. Square Enix has been struggling quite a lot recently. Actually, like a lot, a lot, because right now it says I reportedly lost $200 million on Marvel games for the Avengers and also when it comes to the Guardians of the Galaxy game. Now, Guardians of the Galaxy was received very well, but yes, it just didn't sell. You know, the Avengers MMO game that they tried doing like a live service with, it just wasn't a good game. They've kind of killed the service of the game too. And it's just a shame to see that something like that happen as well as another game. Babylon's Fall. You probably didn't hear about this game because basically nobody is playing it. It was recently launched. It's supposed to be another like MMO RPG kind of live service game that Square Enix was trying to do. And uh, this game also kind of flopped as well. I mean, like really flopped. Where the overall peak was just over a thousand players on Steam. And then with a 24 hour peak of 45 players playing, there's even one point right here, zero people were playing Babylon's Fall at some point. Uh, so this game was Dead on arrival, I got another big hit and loss for Square Enix. Uh, I do believe that they were trying to sell out some of their studios as well. That's like I think the same studio that made Marvel to try to sell it to try to recoup some of the losses that they've had when it comes to some of their games. But yeah, that's a huge hit. If you're new to the channel and missing any content from me recently, check out this place right here. Got a link to all my news and informational videos right there. Thanks so much for watching. Greatly appreciate it. Catch you on the next one. Peace out.